Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 237 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Today on the show, we'll be discussing People of Color Destroy Fantasy and People of Color Destroy Horror, special issues of Fantasy Magazine and Nightmare Magazine written, edited, and illustrated by People of Color. To learn more about the Destroy series, visit DestroySF.com or check out our previous discussions about the series back in episodes 112, 123, 133, 173, and 189. And I'm joined today by three guests. So first up, we've got Daniel Jose Older. He's the New York Times bestselling author of Salsa Nocturna, as well as the Bone Street Rumba series from Rock Books. His young adult novel Shadow Shaper was the New York Times Notable Book of 2015, won the International Latino Book Award, and was named one of Esquire's 80 books every person should read. He also edited the original short story section of People of Color Destroy Fantasy. So, Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. <laughs> then next up, we've got Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. She's the author of the novels Signal to Noise and Certain Dark Things, as well as the short story collections Love and Other Poisons and This Strange Way of Dying, which was a finalist for the Sunburst Award for Excellence in Canadian Literature of the Fantastic. She's also edited several anthologies, including Dead North and Fractured, Tales of the Canadian Post-Apocalypse, and she also edited the original short story section of People of Color Destroy Horror. So, Sylvia, welcome to the show. Hola, thanks for having me. And also joining us today is Maurice Broadus. He's the author of the Knights of Breton Court series from Angry Robot Books, and his short fiction appears in magazines such as Asimov's, Lightspeed, Cemetery Dance, Apex, and Weird Tales. Some of those stories are being collected in the upcoming book Voices of the Martyrs from Rosarium Publishing, and he also co-edited the anthologies Streets of Shadows and Dark Faith. He also edited the nonfiction section of People of Color Destroy Horror. So, Maurice, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, and so the first question I want to bring up is, when did you first start to notice or think about the way that people of color are represented or not represented in fantasy and horror? So, Daniel, let's start with you. What do you think about that? Hmm. You know, I think it was a conversation I was having with myself in kind of a quiet way without having the language for it uh, for all of my life. Uh, I'm you know, I, I, as a kid, like, I remember looking for myself and not finding it and noticing, like, wow, you know, Luke Skywalker has blonde hair and blue eyes. What is, you know, what is that? And that's supposed to be kind of the epitome of, of hero. And there's no one there that, you know, I recognize as, like, home or family. Um, and then I kind of more acutely felt it as I came of age and was in high school and in college and just really looked out there on the landscape and was like, there's just a huge emptiness when it comes to us. Or, uh, you know, we're demons or we're clowns or we're the doomed sidekick. And I turned away from fantasy and sci-fi, even though it was my true love, um, as far as literature goes, for a period of time, because I was just so put out by that. It felt like such a betrayal. Um, and then I kind of started moving back towards it, actually, with uh, reading Harry Potter. And then it was Octavia Butler who I returned to after um, a high school teacher gave me an Octavia Butler book, read it, it blew my mind. And then I kind of like just lost track of her. And then I started reading her again in my 20s and was like, oh, my God, not only are there people of color in there, but this is um, a form of fantasy and sci-fi that really deals with power and gender and race in such a complex and beautiful way and never at the at the loss of the story right so telling these beautiful amazing stories and still talking about all these complex things in the world and i just didn't know you could do it like that with that kind of ferocity and beauty and that's really part of what made me a writer so when you were having those feelings like about luke skywalker were you was that just going on kind of inside your head or were you ever talking to anyone about that no, that was in my head for the most part. It was when I started talking to people that I was like, oh, wait, you know, other people are having these conversations, too. And then reading other authors, too, like Tanana Redu and Nalo Hopkinson, who are actively engaged with that conversation, both with their work and in how they move through the world. And I was like, oh, wow, this is a conversation that's happening. But I didn't know it was happening when I was younger. So why do you think that teacher gave you the Octavia Butler book? Was there was there any conversation that led to that or? Teachers are magic. That's all I know. <laughs> because it was truly like, I mean, I was in the seventh grade. This was my, this was Mrs. Inez Middleton, seventh grade teacher at Boston Latin. And uh, she just took me aside one day and gave me the book. And I feel like it was either a time bomb or a seed planted, you know, depending on how violent you want the metaphor to be. But it truly changed my life in a very long term kind of way. Um, because again, like when I came back to that, I was like, oh my goodness, look at this. And it's been here all along. I just didn't know about it. 
<laughs> well, so how about Sylvia? What was your experience growing up? Uh, I grew up in Mexico, so it was very different from a lot of people who are um, Anglo writers and readers. And so I grew up with uh, two things. One was um, this vein of, uh, of Mexican and Latin American literature that has fantastic elements and is known as magical realism. But I also had, since I was a teenager, access to uh, classic science fiction and fantasy books like Dune or Lord of the Rings because my parents read a lot of that stuff. And I read H.P. Lovecraft since I was about 12 years old. So I had access to both of um, of those currents of, of literature at home. One of the problems that I had was that when I was trying to write when I was a little bit younger, I would make these generic science fiction or fantasy settings. And everybody would be automatically white, and it would be set in this this Anglo world. So people would be in New York or or would be from New York or that kind of thing, but they would be all white and they would all be speaking English and that kind of stuff. And it was because I think I didn't realize that you could have anything anything else, that you could have people from Mexico in space or stuff like that. So that didn't happen until later when, when I started writing more seriously about 10 years ago, and I started exploring what it meant writing for me, that I started thinking about uh, if I could do something else, because those stories I thought were they were really bad. They were really crappy because it was very, um, like everybody's in a, in a kind of British pub and they're having <laughs> British food and there's elves and all that. And I've never been to Great Britain. So I was just kind of imitating the imitations, you know, imitating the things that you see on movies and on TV without any kind of personal experience. And so it felt very fake and very thin and very flat. And, and I realized that because I had read other kinds of literature that was better. So I was kind of wondering, well, what's going on? And then um, I just kind of started doing some stuff and thought that uh, that it could work. And, and I started getting published. And then I also started editing and thinking more about issues of representation. So about 10 years ago in 2006, I think there were not a lot of people of color um, editing or writing a lot of science fiction and fantasy, but around that time, conversations started to happen and some people started to bubble up. So in the 10 years from there, this has become, it's, it's become a lot more common to see people of color represented in magazines and anthologies and conversations now are happening that I think years before would not have happened or would have happened in a much smaller circle. Now, because of the internet, we can have these conversations with not only with people who are um, American or Canadian, but also from people from other countries and regions of the world who have different issues with representation. So can you remember when you first started writing characters of color in your stories? Was there like what was going on in your life or was there a specific incident or author or conversation you had that led to that? It It was just a process. I think I was trying to find my voice, which is something that every writer goes through. And at that point, I knew I wanted, I was interested in writing stuff that was of a fantastical bent, uh, but the things that I was doing that were more, I would say, generic, like Mac Fantasy, were not leaving me satisfied. And I started thinking and using a lot of the elements of my childhood and of the folklore of my, of, that I learned from my great-grandmother in my youth. And I started going back to that because that's what was that's what was speaking to me and that was what was sparking my my imagination and so it just it just became an organic process where i decided that i was interested in doing this and and i was just going to do it even if i didn't see too many examples of that around me hmm. well and so how about maurice what was your experience well um growing up i see i think back to like elementary school and, and uh you know, going back that far, you know, I came up as a comic book reader. And so comic books was, was my gateway in. And so it was actually a conversation that it just never even occurred to me to have. So uh, so growing up reading comic books and then with my high school teachers, when they noticed I was a, a good uh, writer, you know, they they steered me towards like Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen King. And, um, and then on my own, I was reading people like Neil Gaiman. And so the, the, this was like my entryway into the genre. 
Um, and for me, the conversation didn't really start. I guess it started a couple of different ways. For for one, um, I, I started attending conventions in like uh, 2002. Um, it was like the, it was World Horror Convention, and it was in Chicago. And I, I remember looking around that convention, trying to find me there. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is this is a very, very white place. I, it just never even occurred to me that the genre, you know, just looking, yeah, I could get a feel for the genre just by looking around the room going, there is, where, 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 where are me? <laughs> where, where are people like me? <laughs> uh, and, and it's funny because I, I, the two writers I, I met who were like me end up being Rath James White and, and Chesha Burke. And I, it's like, I, I found them, I grabbed them, and I've never <laughs> let go of them since. Um, so that so that, that was uh, one way where the, the conversation just started to, to, to just begin to uh, pinprick me. Um, and then um, for the, the other thing, uh, it was kind of ties back to what Sylvie was saying in terms of finding your voice. I was still struggling with finding my voice at this time. Um, and it was uh, and, and the thing that really kind of really started to, uh, to bother me was as I, I like I, said, I was coming up as a horror writer, and so people when they would like write my bios and introduce me and things, they were like, "Oh, it's Maurice Broadus. He's he's the Black Stephen King." Oh, jeez. And oh. and there was just something every time I heard that phrase, the Black Stephen King, and I ended up talking to Brandon Massey about this too because he was another one who they kept going, "It's the Black Stephen King. It's the Black Stephen King." And it's like. <laughs> That whole idea of being defined from the outside of, you know, I can't be my own person. I have to be, I mean, to, so part of it is I, I'm flattered by the comparison to Stephen King because, hey, if I can have half that career, I'd be happy. But at the same time, it's like, no, what, what, it's like you've erased part of me in that mm. comparison. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. So, so that, that really started to, to, I really started to struggle with that idea. And then it wasn't Octavia Butler that brought me, uh, that, that helped me find my voice. It was actually Walter Mosley mm. for me. Um, he had he had a short story collection called Futureland, and uh, and I can't even remember how I ran across this collection. But I was like, well, oh, oh, I'm a big crime fiction. I, I love crime fiction, and so I, I picked up this book. I was like, oh, the Walter Mosley collection, um, and I read it. And I was expecting a short story, a, a short crime story collection, but it was a science fiction collection, and it was the blackest world I've ever, <laughs> ever encountered. And there's no fine way to put it. And I was like, whoa. I, and it blew my head because I was like, I didn't know we could do this. And and that, and, and I remember I was, I wasn't even halfway through the first story. And I was like, I did not know we could do this. Well, and, it's just wild because it was six easy pieces, his actual crime um, uh -huh. collection. That was the other book that really got me. It was Octavia, oh, okay, it was okay. Ed, Walter, <laughs> and it was Juno Diaz's uh, Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde. But mm, six yeah. pieces, like, holy crap, that just sucked me right in. I read the whole right thing in a night. Yep. And I was just, that was another book. Like, I just think between all those books, those made me the writer I am, like, for exactly. real. Walter's a genius. It's yeah, genius, absolutely. Yeah. I, I also concur with that feeling of, I didn't know we could do that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Are we allowed to do that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Well, so, yeah. So, I mean, Maurice, you mentioned going to science fiction convention. I'm just curious what, like, Sylvia, what was your experience? Did you go, have you, start, did you start going to science fiction conventions or comic conventions or things? Like, what was uh, your experience with that? No, I'm in Canada, so I tend to stay over here on my side of the continent. Um, and I've gone to a few, but the ones I went was very similar to Maurice, where, um, I would be maybe the only person of color in the whole in the whole building, and and it was strange because I went to one in Vancouver in a section of the city called Richmond, which is predominantly Asian and Chinese. So when you're outside, all the signs are kind of in Chinese, and everybody is Chinese basically. And then I went into the place into the hotel where the convention was happening, mm -hmm. and everybody was white inside. So it was strange because I would go have my meals outside at the mall or at the restaurant, and there everybody is speaking Mandarin or Cantonese, and everybody looks different. And then I would go in, and suddenly every, everybody's white, and it was just the strangest thing. It was like two totally different worlds, and I and I was just kind of like, why are none of why why aren't these people here? Right? There's like there's a ton of people outside there, and but they weren't going they weren't going in to the to the convention, and it wasn't like they were not consuming uh, products because I know some of these people watch, you know, shows or comic books or whatever. But it was just like it seemed like this 
and yeah, like two different worlds. It was it was the strangest sensation, and that sensation kept on happening, and mm. has kept on happening with whatever I I I have gone to. Um, I mean, it has gotten a little bit better, I think, in the years since because I went to this Lovecraft thing in in Rhode Island, the Necronomicon, and there were I think eight people from Latin America, and they were actually from Argentina and Mexico and that kind of thing, and that was like the weirdest thing to find people that spoke Spanish and looked like me. It was it was so odd. You you want to hug them because <laughs> yeah, like Maureen said, it's like oh my god, somebody like me. And so that was that was a good experience, but that's not that's not a common experience. I mean, Dan- Daniel, would you say you had pretty similar experiences going to conventions? Yeah, my first convention was WizCon, which is a feminist sci-fi convention in Madison, and um, I was I was in a way lucky because Cherie Renee Thomas, who's the great um, editor and writer who did the Dark Matter anthology, so she was having this conversation like 15 years ago, right? With um, that was a um, anthology about speculative fiction from the African diaspora. And uh, she, I took a class with her. She kind of became my mentor when I was first coming up as a writer. So she was like, you know, you got to go to WizCon. And I did. And immediately she brought me into the kind of POC contingent of folks that were there, you know, like Tempest Bradford and Andrew Hairston and Amma Patterson and, you know, these really great folks and amazing writers. And uh, they just let me know, you know, what was the deal. <laughs> so, and I also wasn't surprised. And then it was a couple of years later, I went to, New York Comic Con for the first time as a speaker and was just blown away by how diverse that convention is because I was so used to, I had gone to a bunch of other like smaller sci-fi ones, um, which were, as, as everyone's been saying, very, very, very white. And then NYCC is like, what? Like it's, it's totally uh, just black and brown. Like there's so many, it's so diverse and it's so naturally diverse and they don't make a big deal out of it. And they have the conversations about it or they have recently um, been having really good paneling about it. And it's just phenomenal. And the disconnect is, you know, as Sylvia was saying, it's very intense to to be in a city that sometimes is very black or brown and then like the convention is not. And it, it really speaks to this question of, I think, readership and what is sci-fi as a genre doing, whether it's in publishing or in the movie industry, you know, to reach out to the people who have been loyal fans for decades, you know, because people of color have always been loving sci-fi. That's not a new thing. Um but what, you know, what is publishing now doing to speak to them? And I think we're starting to see that happen, which makes this a really exciting moment. Well, yeah, that's what I wanted to, one thing I wanted to ask you guys about is you're all writers. And when you started writing work and submitting it to, for publication, um, did you find publishers were receptive to the characters of color in your work? Or like, I, don't, <laughs> uh, I guess, Daniel, do you have a, a response to that? <laughs> I think we all have the same chuckle inside or out. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, you know, like this was I, I, I was I started I wrote Shadow Shaper. I started in 2009 um, and I was submitting it. This was before We Need Diverse Books, of course, and all these movements that popped up. Um, the conversation has been ongoing, but it hadn't taken off in a way that was really organized until, uh, you know, two years ago. And so, no, Shadow Shaper was just roundly rejected over and over. It, it received over 40 rejections from agents. Um, and a lot of them were like, oh, this is great. We just don't think we could market it. Um, or like, we just don't like the, the character. We don't identify with the character, you know, who's this, who's this, um, Afro-Latina girl in bed style. And I was sitting there like, well, you know, the character maybe wasn't for you to identify with. <laughs> it's like, uh, that's a possibility. I'm not writing to a, a 30 year old white woman. I'm, I'm writing to the kids of color that I work with in Bushwick. Um, and so it, there's a lot of complex conversations to be had there for sure, but there was no sense that the industry or that there was a readership for it. And I knew that there was a readership because that's the population that I live in, with and am and work with and everything else. So, you know, I know these kids are looking for books and, you know, books with themselves in there and seeing themselves. Um, but no. And then and then sometimes I would get I would make some headway and then I would get notes back like, oh, you know. This scene where where uh, Sierra feels uncomfortable in a white neighborhood because they're all looking at her like she wants to steal something because she doesn't have a baby carriage with a white baby in it, that that wouldn't happen now, you know, not not in 2012 or whatever. And I'm sitting there, like, it's just not for you to define, you know, what different forms of oppression go on. And that's, you know, these are all these kind of crossroads and difficult questions that particularly writers of color, writing characters of color have to deal with as we navigate the industry, because the industry is majority white, you know, and isn't prepared to have these complex conversations. 
I mean, Maurice, what was what's been your experience submitting work for publication? Um, let's see. I, um, it kind of goes back to the, the conversation, you, uh, the question you asked earlier about what was the, the first piece that where uh, you know I, I really felt like I, I had found my voice. And uh, for me, it was a story called Family Business. And uh, and I at this point, I'm starting to explore. Like my mother is, is Jamaican. And so I'm, I'm starting to revisit some of the stories uh, that, uh, that that she would tell me, uh, you know, as a kid, you know, growing up, you ignore those stories because it's like, oh, mom's talking again. And then uh, later in your, when you're, you know, you're a writer going, mom, tell me more stories. I need more stories. Um, and so I, I start writing, you know, from, you know, that, that sort of place. And so, uh, you know, early on, you know, there were like editors who would like come back with, you know, well, this story, you know, can't relate to it. Uh, could you change? I remember one of the big comments I used to get early on was, can you change the names? Uh, mm-hmm. Because people couldn't relate to the names I was using. They just sounded too, uh, and they would always dance, dance around what it sounded too much like. <laughs> um, but uh, but Weird, uh, Family Business ended up being my first uh, professional sale, and that, uh, and that went to Weird Tales. Now, after that happened, uh, there was something interesting I, I, I started watching in, in the genre because Brandon Massey did this anthology called uh, Dark Dreams. And it, and it was the first time that there was this all, was a horror anthology of just all black writers. And, uh, and I was curious to see what that sort of response to that would be in the marketplace. And the amount of pushback on that mm. really opened my eyes. Because uh, all of a sudden you had all these people coming out the closet talking about reverse racism or... Right. Um, Oh, what uh, affirmative action writing and all the all these other sort of uh, terms that just start coming out of the woodwork when it was just about late. And and, and my, one of my things was I think you guys have missed the point about this. This is the, the point is there are a lot of a there's a lot of black people writing horror, and b there's a huge market for horror in the black community that you you've been so wrapped up in writing your stories for you. You've sort of missed the fact that no, there is a wide open market here, and Brandon is just a savvy writer saying, "Hey, I'm going to write stories for my people," and there was a huge market for it. And the, and the, and the, the Dark Dreams trilogy uh, it was a huge success, but no one wanted to see that, and no one wanted to talk about that. They want all they saw was, well, black people are trying to write and trying to get in the genre. Why can't they submit to blah 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 like everyone else does? Uh, you know, so, as opposed to, well, you've locked us out of those markets. We formed our own, and now you're complaining about it. Well, it's interesting, Maurice. In your piece, you refer to SQWs um, as opposed to SJWs. I've never heard that before. Did you coin that, or where did that come <laughs> yeah, from? Just, yeah, I kind of made that up. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, and, and that's but that's what it was. It's the people who want the status quo, mm. and and but and that's what they're advocating for. Uh, there's, I've uh, last year, I, I even though I sort of taken a step back over the last couple of years from you know being provocative online, you know, I end up getting in this shouting match. Uh, with an editor because he was trying to defend his all white anthology, and I'm just like, that's fine, own it. You 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 saw you wanted the status quo. You read only within what you your little comfort zone. You aren't trying to find new voices. You want the voices of that you've kind of grown up with and that fit your little taste, and you don't want to do the work of finding new voices. Mm-hmm. That's fine, just own it. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, you have these editors who just want to fight for the status quo. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Go with God. That's a good term, man. I'm going to use that term. <laughs> That's a great term. I mean, Sylvia, do you want to say something about what's what's been your experience uh, submitting work? Um, well, I will say that uh, although I am, my novels are traditionally published, and I do have an agent now, um, I, I've, a lot of my short fiction work and my editing has been going on basically not in the pro magazines, and I started my own company and started editing anthologies and, and a magazine back in 2009. And the World Fantasy Award that I have won, which I won this week, year for editing an anthology called She Walks in Shadows, it, it was something that I published too. So I think one of the things that happened to me was that um, I just kind of did my own thing. I submitted to a lot of small, smaller magazines that I liked or that I enjoyed, and I started editing anthologies on my own dime and just kind of quietly building um, what what I saw as, you know, as, as my editing career and, and as my writing career without asking permission of anybody because it, nobody kind of wanted me. And, it, and, I, and I don't think it was that they didn't want me because I was brown. It's just that there's so many writers and, you know, they, you know, they weren't like particularly 
looking for anybody new and that kind of thing. So I, I just kind of started writing and editing and, um, and, and I, and I met a lot of interesting people while I, while I was doing that. And, and I guess I gained a little bit of a profile, especially in the Lovecraft community, because it's very small. So the benefit of that is that if, if you do something there, kind of like everybody gets to know you in, in a little while. So everybody kind of got to know me in that community. And, and so I was able to do several projects there that I was interested in, including She Walks in Shadows, which is an all-woman uh, Lovecraft-inspired an anthology, and that was good. But I, you know, to this day, I don't, it's not like I get a ton of invitations to anthologies or magazines, because I don't. So, um, like, what I did recently was that I, you know, I've never been published by Tor.com, but they do those novella things. So, so I just point blank kind of asked an editor that I know, and we're not friends or anything, like, we talked in passing maybe on Twitter, and so I asked him by email, what do I have to do to get, like, to sell a novella to you? And then he was like, oh, I really like your work. So, yeah, you should send me something. But it was, you know, I think you, you have to be bold, or, or I was bold. Several times I've done that where I was like, so, you know, like, I want to be in this magazine, or I'm going to do this thing, and I'm, and I'm going to get in there, um, as opposed to expecting opportunities to, to drop on on my lap. Because I think, you know, I'm the last person a lot of people think about when they're looking to fill their anthology or when they're looking for, for a writer uh, for a project. I should say, Sylvia published one of my first short stories before, like, anyone was trying to hear from me at all. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I, and it's one of the stories that went on to become the Bone Street Roomba um, books and series. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a, an important thing, I think, out there is that, you know, sometimes we, we look to each other to find a path through. I know that a lot of different folks have helped lift me up because they've been through that whole process of just trying to navigate it and what does that mean? And so, you know, they were there to be like, whether it was like, you know, submit to this anthology or I'm going to take your story that no one else is trying to hear about or read or let me just give you this piece of advice to keep you going when the rejections are piling up. In fact, Daniel was that person for me. I remember uh, I was struggling with uh, uh, whether or not I should write this novel that had been, uh, uh, you know, bubbling around in the back of my head. I was just like, man, this is kind of it was it's it's black and it's political, and I I don't know, you know if I should even you know bother entertaining this idea. You know, who's going to buy it? Um, and then I just called up Daniel, like Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and uh, it, it, and he just. And we spent like about half an hour, 45 minutes on the phone. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just that and just the encouragement of, hey, it's your story, you know, write your story. I think um, I said do that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, that's exactly what you said. <laughs> and and, and I, but, I mean, sometimes you sometimes just need that. And I needed that voice. And I needed those words to just push me through. Well, I mean, Sylvia, you mentioned your Lovecraft anthology and reading the essays in People of Color Destroy Fantasy and People of Color Destroy Horror. Uh, Lovecraft's name comes up over and over again uh, as someone that people obviously have very conflicted, complicated feelings about. Do you want to say just how do you feel about Lovecraft and his influence on horror? Well, Lovecraft is, is just one of those great shadows of horror, right? It's it's and and science fiction and fantasy too. It's like Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe and probably Stephen King defined you know multiple generations of what it means to write horror. So, um, so he, he casts an, an incredibly, uh, wide, wide shadow. And, and that has several implications, both good and, and bad. One of the good implications is that he was very generous with his, um, with his world. He shared, even when he was alive with other writers, the possibilities of writing stories that took place in the same universe. He wasn't adverse to that. So the benefit of that is that it's a very uh, malleable and very flexible medium. So unlike something like Lord of the Rings or Dune, because of copyright issues and because the universe is much more strict, in Lovecraft land, kind of, there's a feeling of anything goes. So people can write things that respond to him or that interpret him, deconstruct or construct again the narratives in different ways. And I think that's the benefit, and, and that's why... Um, you're seeing uh, a big boom of um, of Lovecraft anthologies and Lovecraft products, but especially in the past two years, 
I've seen, uh, I mean, when I started editing Lovecraft stuff, there was like almost no people of color um, writing it. There were very few. Um, so I would have to go and kind of ask people to write some stories, you know, sometimes these awkward conversations. Would you like to, uh, to write a Lovecraft-inspired story? And some people of color would tell me, well, no, no, Lovecraft was racist, so uh, I can't write that. And I would be like, well, yeah, but um, but why don't you, you know, give your own spin to it? And, and they would be like, okay, well, I'm going to do some research and I'll come back. And then some of them, they would get really excited and they would come back and they would be like, oh, I read this thing that he wrote um, and I have this great idea as a springboard from that, and then and then they would write it. So that happened several times uh, with writers. And then it, I think in the past two years we've seen um, people like Cassandra Call and um, and books like The Ballad of Black Tom and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Victor Laval, yeah. Yeah, which are really interested in Lovecraftian and Lovecraft as a figure, and not in reproducing him exactly, but in their responses to him. But yeah, this, despite whatever um, misgivings you may have about Lovecraft, whether you love him or you hate him or whatever, he does have that benefit that, for example, this couldn't have happened with, you know, or not have happened as easily with a product such as Lord of the Rings. Well, Maurice, you actually, speaking of Victor Lavelle, you actually interviewed him in, in here about the Ballad of Black Tom. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, because uh, yeah, I, it was no one of those experiences where I, when I read Black, uh, *Battle of Black Tom*, I was just like, finally, uh, a, a Lovecraft story I can appreciate because uh, I've tried reading Lovecraft several, several times because of the the shadow that he casts over the genre. You know, I, I try to read all the people who you know help shape the genre and stuff, but I'm just like, I just could not, could not get into Lovecraft a, a, at all. Um, and so, so as it turns out, Victor, and I've been following Victor's career for a while, uh, Battle of Black Tom was a great entry point for me personally, um, in, in terms of being able to, you know, finally come to the uh, uh, Lovecraft mythos in, in a way that actually connects to me. Um, but in the interview with, uh, with Victor, I mean, one of the things, frankly, that I was most curious about is like, hey, as a Black artist, you know, what pressures do you feel when a term comes to... Uh, producing the stories that you produce. Uh, what, what responsibilities do you feel to the community? Um, what responsibilities do you feel to the genre in terms of taking on something like like Lovecraft? Um, those are those are the kind of questions that, that interest me as, as as an artist, frankly. And so here again, having an excuse to have Victor speak on on those topics was was, uh, was great. Well, it was kind of interesting because he says that he sort of views Lovecraft the way you would view a beloved relative who says stupid offensive things, where. <laughs> you you know you you love them because they helped you learn how to ride a bike or whatever but you understand mm-hmm. it if people who don't have that history with them uh have no interest in interacting with them whatsoever right uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I did my thesis on lovecraft so yeah i spent a lot of time with him and and my my advisor called him my creepy boyfriend <laughs> yeah, yeah I, that uh, guy, yeah the definition is it's that guy who um <laughs> Yeah, you met when you were 15, and uh, even though years later you realize that, you know, he's not that great or whatever, but but you have all these good (laughs) moments with him, so you still take the phone calls when he calls. (laughs) Yep, yep. I'm I'm actually right in between the two of y'all because I definitely... um... You know, I was I was definitely a big part of the movement to unseat him as the uh, face of the World Fantasy Award. Um, mm-hmm. And I also uh, enjoy his, his work in some ways and, you know, can appreciate him. I think what's important is that we're able to have a complex conversation about him, which is what, you know, we've been doing. But immediately when we begin to critique the other side of things, you know, the Lovecraft fanboys turn it into like, oh, this is censorship. You guys don't want you want to erase the history and everything he's done. And it's like, no, no, no. We just want to talk about what it really is, you know, and what it really is, is the dude was a wild, rabid racist in a very racist time in a very racist country. That is part of why, you know, his legacy has continued. It's people always say like, oh, in spite of his racism, you know, his legacy continued. No, like, no. It's a <laughs> country. people were down for that. It was, it's like the age of legal discrimination in all kinds of ways. So, you know, he thrived in part because of his racism and he really did weaponize literature in a way that was very uh, damaging to people who are reading it. Because it's not even like we didn't show up. Like, we showed up and we were demons. Like, we killed children in those stories. Mm-hmm. 
So I think the rise of the counter narrative that we're seeing right now uh, with Cassandra's work and Victor's work and Sylvia's and so many others, it's like this really exciting clapback and a way of being in deep conversation with the work. You know, like you have to love the work to a certain level to engage with it that deeply, you know, even with a critique. And it's like the same thing when, you know, you see like the, the feminist critique of hip hop, like it, it comes from love and it, it comes from a deep need to express ourselves and, and find ourselves in the work. Um, so I think, I think it's an amazing conversation that we're having. And I think it includes also not lionizing uh, people who are very damaging to a huge portion of the population. And I think we can hold all those things to be true and, and you know, keep moving forward. Well, I'm really curious, Daniel, because you mentioned that, yeah, you were very um, visible in this effort. And I'm just wondering, just what was that like for you personally to be such a focus of controversy like that? <laughs> it was weird. You know, I, I, I'm really happy that the change happened. Um, I think the conversation that it sparked was exactly what needed to happen. Um, and that that was amazing. You know, for, first of all, let me just say that Nettie Okorafor, who's an amazing writer, who put up a blog about feeling conflicted about receiving the award um, now quite a few years ago, uh, which I referenced in the petition that I put up, um, took really the most heat of all of anyone. And that's really about how particularly black women are treated online. Um, you know, she got the death threats and the rape threats and her inbox was constantly barraged with hate. Um, whereas I did get hate, uh, but never to the level that she did. And I think that bears mentioning because it is a truth of the world that we live in right now. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's like I said, like I, I, I believe in having a nuanced conversation and getting into it and, and really like discussing what it is. Uh, most of the people that engaged with me were not interested in having that. They were either just mad or they, you know, received what I was saying as to just be a blanket statement of like, let's erase all this history or these different interpretations, or they were just cursing me out or threatening me, you know, which is what happens when you start speaking out. So that's what it is. <laughs> but like I said, I think, you know, counter narratives are really exciting. I'm working on something with uh, Rosarium right now. Um, that's a comic book series that takes place in old Brooklyn. Um, and it's definitely, you know, in response to Lovecraft in its ways. And so I just think, you know, it's an exciting time to do creative work and to be in the middle of it. Sometimes that work is on the page and with characters and fantasy, and sometimes it's in engaging our community. Um, you know, ultimately, I think it's about asking our community, the community of fantasy and sci-fi, to live up to what it, you know, purports to be as a, as a realm of the imagination that's for everybody. Right. Well, when you, when you talk about women of color being treated very badly, both online and at conventions and things, that makes me think of Alyssa Wong's essay in here, mm -hmm. where she talks about that very directly. And she made this observation I thought was really interesting, where she says that basically people that horror uh, resonates with people of color in a unique way, because people of color experience the world as this sort of malevolent, hostile place um, in a way that white people just don't in America. And I mean, Maurice, you edited this um, essay, right? Is there anything else you want to say about that piece? Uh, well, I always feel uh, in this uh, weird place whenever I'm editing like a series of, of essays, because I always feel like I, it's like I have all these feelings of things I want to say. Let me find the people who can say it much better <laughs> than, than what I have going on in my head right now. And so when Alyssa turned in that essay, I was just like, I, I've never wanted to hug an essay before. <laughs> But that was one of the early ones I, I wanted to hug. I was just like, that was so right where I was feeling. And I was just like, yes, this is exactly what I wanted to say right now. And God bless you, Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Sylvia, do you have anything you want to say about on that subject? Um, yeah, I, for people of horror, the story, pe people of color, the story of horror, I, um, one of the things that struck me about the slush pile for, for people of color was that um, in comparison to the other slush piles that I have seen, this one tended to feature a lot more economic problems than people from lower socioeconomic classes or people who were struggling. And I would say that in a lot of the other piles, um, which were a lot more uh, a lot more white, the problems and the issues tended to like kind of the upper classes. So. I found that kind of interesting because it did feel different, and, it, and it's kind of hard to put to put your finger on it. But uh, one way to think about it is like, 
when when you normally go to the movies and you watch a horror movie, count the number of people who have gigantic houses, like just in a house, not an apartment, like a suburban house with a picket fence. And you will see that there's a lot, and 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 they're all white, and so there's very few small apartments, and um, and I think that says something because it there's this it almost feels yeah like another like a parallel universe where in these movies everybody has this big house and a big car, and and you think is that true? And I think if we had more people of color on screen, you we wouldn't have as many huge houses and things like that. Right. And I mean, Daniel, you edited fiction for this as well, right? Did you have some more observations about the stories you were getting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's really fascinating to sort of see the things that come up when you do ask for something very specific. Um, I also edited an anthology uh, called Long Hidden with Rose Fox, which was speculative fiction from marginalized histories. And that was really quite uh, fascinating, first of all, to see who uh, considers what marginalized and then also who considers what fantasy, right? Because we would get some submissions that were like, um, very real world stories. And then the, the quote unquote fantasy aspect was like, uh, a ritual being done, you know, uh, uh, in a people of color community, right? Like a Vodun ritual or a hoodoo ritual. And it's like, you know, these are actually, um, you know, practices like that would be like the fantasy element of a story is uh, Christmas. You know, <laughs> like, um, these are things we do and we believe in. And uh, that's, you know, so I, I do think that when you open up the doors um, to a genre like fantasy, really fascinating things kind of start to play out. And you do start to see like all these conversations are happening in a very beautiful way um, that weren't happening. The, the, the genre is forced to reckon with itself. Uh, both on, again on the page and in in live time, you know, online and everything else in nonfiction, uh, with a lot of these questions that haven't been asked, right? So for a long time, it was very standard for the general, uh, I would say, kind of flow of of fantasy fiction to be very pro imperialist, right? Even if they were saying that the bad guys called the evil empire, there's still a uh, a very colonial mentality in going to other places and taking over or helping the natives or destroying the natives or whatever, it's very easy to see colonial history play out from the point of view of the colonizer for most of um, history of this genre. Uh, and now you're seeing the opposite happen and you're seeing folks writing from the point of view of the folks who were supposed to be destroyed and everything else. Um, and that's so good for literature, right? Literature becomes better when more voices are involved, when more points of view are involved, when it becomes more layered, it becomes more historically complex. Like those are all just things that we get to witness now because the doors have, have, have been kicked in. Well, I mean, there's, there's a really interesting essay by Justina Ireland where she sort of touches on a little bit of, of this, of the sort of the problematicness of having POC authors writing POC characters in POC worlds and that all just being kind of its own separate ecosystem disconnected from the wider genre. Right. Um, I don't know, uh, Maurice, do you want to touch? I, 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 I want to mention this line. She, she says that um, one of the things she'd like to see is populating a European based fantasy with black elves, Latino dwarves and a hapless Chinese farm boy. Um, <laughs> is that something? Do you agree with that? Uh, is that something you'd like to see? No. In fact, that sounds like all of my D and D adventures. Frank, when I was a gamer, and the, that was exactly it. It would be uh, everybody would choose all these characters, and then I would be that one black character in the story, going, "Yeah, you know what? No, why? Why am I here?" But that, in a lot of ways, that's kind of the stories I'm expected to write. You know, when uh, when you know, uh, I'm invited to different anthologies. They're kind of, I'm oh man, I can't remember what anthology. I got I got an invitation to a, a science fiction anthology, and literally the editor wrote me and said, "Hey, we want this science fiction. It's about exploration in, in the in the galaxy." But hey, can you do that urban thing that you do? <laughs> and I'm like, no, we're not we're not doing this, um, and. Uh, so, so yeah, so um, in fact, uh, one of the things I was very conscious of when I was putting together the essays for, for uh, uh, POC uh, Destroy Horror was the fact of, you know what, I don't even want to be just locked into a Western perspective of horror right. uh, and a Western outlook of, of horror. Um, and that's one reason why I, I reached out to like Alyssa, for example, um, 
I wanted to, and, and Chanello's essay, uh, also the whole idea of how is horror, how, in fact, how is Western horror even perceived from the outside, from other cultures? Uh, that was a, another thing that just really much interested me because the, uh, for me, the whole joy of writing stories is the fact that I get to reflect my story. I get to reflect my culture. I get to reflect, you know, and, and bring people to these places they would they would normally overlook. Mm-hmm. Uh, or walk by or roll up their windows and lock their car doors and speed through as fast as possible. I mean, that is, that is my world. So, you know, the whole idea of being disconnected. Yeah, you disconnected us. That's why there's this disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, let, let me jump in on the counterpoint to that, because that's really it's a really interesting combo. But I, I think what she's saying isn't really any different than what we're talking about with having a counter narrative to Lovecraft. Right. Like, um, first of all, we were back there. We were there in those medieval times that we got erased from you know, in, in modern fantasy literature. And that's one of the great lies of, I think, mo- the mm. most white modern fantasy stuff that we've been seeing, starting, you know, with Tolkien and on, is that we weren't there, but we were there. Like, it's a historical fact, it's documented, it's everywhere, it's true. Uh, medieval POC has a great Tumblr, and, and it's just there. So I think there's that truth to be reclaimed. And then I think there's the idea of just, you know, what happens when you take the context of this world and then shake it up and bring us in in a way that's not just as a side character or whatever, or not just a demon, and then really shake up that that thing? So my main thing is, like, I think we just have to be up in it in all different ways. You know, there's going to be people yeah. that really want to do their whole new world their own way or very old world their own way. And there's going to be people that want to jump into the the like kind of age old timeless epic fantasy stuff that they're familiar with and then shape uh change up something else you know and i think it's kind of really cool that we we see both happening at the same time and that they're also in conversation with each other i mean sylvia do you want to weigh in on this um yeah i think one of the problems when there's these conversations about diversity in um is that a lot of times they mean only diversity in terms of the color of the character and not diversity in terms of the narrative. So if you're speaking about diversity in terms of narrative and culture, you cannot have the exact same Lord of the Rings story, but now there's an Asian farm boy or a Latino farm boy on the side because we don't necessarily tell stories the same way that you do. So that whole idea of, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons universe, but there's one, you know, but there's a Mexican now on this side, it's not going to work if you're speaking about really diverse narratives. Because what would emerge if you said, can you create a secondary universe fantasy with Latin American elements might be very different from your expectations. It, it, it might not be Warcraft or uh, Game of Thrones. And I think it's problematic when you expect Game of Thrones, but now with, you know, a Mexican person in exactly the same way. And I do think that is what a lot of people want and desire. They desire the same things that make them comfortable. And so they don't want to approach maybe a different kind of literature and a different kind of storytelling. Um, but I mean, I know Justina is very smart and I'm sure her essay has more, uh, more nuances than that, but that was one of the problems that I had when I was starting to write and find my voice is that I wanted to write the same stories, you know, with the same farm boy. And then it didn't help if I really called him Pepe and that was it. Right. But yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I've been told is that, you know, urban, urban fantasy doesn't sell anymore and my vampire novel people loved it but people said well it's not going to sell and maybe they were right but then the answer was like well why don't you write something like game of thrones and, well, <laughs> in game of thrones they don't have piñatas so <laughs> and they don't have mezcal and they don't have all these other things so it's problematic for me to just you know yes yeah, suddenly say king pepe walked into the room and it's like okay well that's not exactly that's not exactly going to work and i do feel that um people want they want us to do that sometimes and and like danielle said and that means for example they they say things like well i like this book but it had all these social issues so the social (laughs) issues made me uncomfortable and it's like what are you asking us to do exactly then it's to give you a narrative that is antiseptic um that has no rough edges that you know just completely you know doesn't upset you at all 
because I've, I've had people say that of, of my stories. Oh, it just had, you know, those vampires had too many social issues. Yeah. And, and mm-hmm. it's like, how would you like me to tell the story then? Right. That, you know, that comfort issue is so fascinating because I think it comes up again and again, um, not just in the conversation about literature, but in academia, you know, in politics. And so much of it demands that we then ask ourselves, like, who is comfortable and who are we writing for? Right. Because I know most of us have been very uncomfortable reading fantasy literature for our entire <laughs> lives because it's racist. And that's much worse kind of discomfort than being like, oh, no, you're talking about an issue that is calling me out of my shit or whatever. Um, and and I, I, to me, the greatest compliment uh, that I've gotten about my work is um, from people who say it feels like home and they've never known home in a book before because the, the, because fantasy hasn't uh, allowed for that. Um, because of its whiteness and sometimes of its maleness. And so, you know, I think, like, that's that's beautiful. And if I can do that and give that to someone who hasn't had that experience, then it really doesn't matter to me if then I get a troll on Goodreads who's like, oh, there weren't enough nice white people in the book or whatever, you know, <laughs> whatever, like, silly shit they come up with to whatever. Um, so, you know, I think as writers, we, particularly as writers of color, we have to know our audience and who are we writing to and why are we writing and that's an important conversation to have with ourselves. Just like we have to ask ourselves, what does success look like, right? Um, to back to the, this idea, like, is it going to be me getting away from all the people that brought me here, or is it going to be us rising together, which is really what it has to be? Yeah, I know, uh, like, with the, the uh, as I've been watching my career, you know, as a novelist develop, when I was writing those stories that were like, I was in my Stephen King mode or my Neil Gaiman mode, those stories fell flat, frankly. Um, they fell flat for me when I was writing them, and frankly, you know, when I was sending them out to uh, agents and, and publishers, they they weren't uh, they they sort of felt I don't know I guess generic might be the the word for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I started really diving into my own voice uh, and really diving into my world, that's that's what made, that's what I think what I brought to the the King Arthur mythos with the, with the Night series. Um, and I'm, but I was as shocked as uh, frankly I was shocked when Angry Robot picked it up. Because I was like, this is a story set in the hood. And this is a hood hood story. Um, and and I, so I was frankly shocked when they picked it up. But I felt that that was also truly authentically me. And, I, and that was the first time that I really felt like, no, this is this is the story I wrote. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's like I'm playing with uh, some other people's beloved toys, I guess. Because I, I had all sorts of pushback from the whole, well, you can't do that to my King Arthur. And all of a sudden, everybody gets really possessive about their King Arthur. Um, and, and even, even the, the criticism I got that, uh, and this was actually one of my favorite criticisms was when a, a lady wrote me and said, Hey, your story is too ghetto. Mm. And, and I was like, huh, that's interesting. I wonder if a, a story set on Mars, you would describe as too Martian. Uh, <laughs> that's basically my response to her, but yeah, it's just that interesting. That. <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've had both. I've had, your story is too Mexican. And also oddly enough, your story is not Mexican enough. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're almost out of time, but one thing I, I really want to talk about, Maurice, is that there's this essay by Chesia Burke where she talks about <laughs> whether Beloved by Toni Morrison, why it hasn't been embraced as a horror novel by the horror genre. Could you talk about that? Yeah, um, that's actually, uh, and as I mentioned, Chesia is like uh, one of my oldest oldest friends in, in, in this business. And so um, one of the things with, with, uh, with her writing that is, uh, there are arguments that he, that she and I have offline that I'm always like, why aren't we having this conversation in public? And uh, and, and that was one of them. That uh, that actually sprang from a I think a, an hour and a half, well, an hour and a half rant from her um, <laughs> on this very topic. And I was just like, yes, we need to have this conversation out loud um, because it there are it's like there are certain uh, and I've I've watched this in the horror community where you bring up certain books and and it's like, oh yeah, I guess that was written. Uh, but we don't really consider that part of the canon. And, and I've seen that happen a lot with uh, actually the two that, that, that come to mind a lot is it was Toni Morrison and actually, and frankly, uh, Tanana Reeve Do, mm. where it's like people forget that, oh, yeah, I guess she did do some horror stuff. I'm like, really? Because uh, she's like she's, one of the, she's the queen of horror. Right, exactly. And it's yeah. like, but in, in horror, it's like she's also like this also ran uh, when, when it comes to the, the, the greats of the genre. And so, uh, oh. And so where the, the, the conversation sprang up about Beloved is I, I was uh, talking to Chesha about the whole idea of, hey, you, uh, I, Beloved makes people uncomfortable. 
uh, and, and I don't think it fits their their definition of, of, of horror. And, and and the conversations we were seeing were the fact that people would describe it, and they would describe it as horror, but so, but it wasn't it wasn't their uh, um, not their it wasn't their entertaining brand of horror. You know, there's there's stuff that can scare you. That's one thing, but no, this horror felt real. And it's like, yeah, yes, it did feel real because this horror was real, uh, and, and that and and that suddenly now we're losing the entertainment value. That that whole cathartic release aspect of horror isn't there for them anymore, as opposed to confronting them on no, this is the historical reality of of horror. This is horror that was done to people. This is the, the, how horror gets played out in people's lives, uh, and, and and some people just don't want that mirror reflection. Uh, and, and so with, with Cheshire, and, and, and there, uh, there are a few writers who, uh, who, who, can, who can bring that level of passion uh, uh, that, that Cheshire can bring to it. That I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to pick this whole argument apart bit by bit and just make you feel stupid for even holding this position. That's, that's Cheshire. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're all out of time. So just maybe to wrap things up, I'd like to go around and have each of you guys just say a couple of final words about what the experience has been like of editing people of color destroy fantasy or people of color destroy horror. So Maurice, any final thoughts on this uh, experience? Yeah. Um, actually it was a, I look at it as just a great honor, uh, frankly, because I got to work with a lot of great writers and frankly, writers uh, who uh, it's kind of like what Sylvia was saying, you know, you don't go straight to these known quantities, but, you know, going and finding some of these like up and coming writers who are right on the cusp um, and just getting to, to, to give them a platform just to speak to, you know, in a lot of ways, speak truth to power. And that's actually, you know, that was pretty much my sole intention. So, yeah. and Sylvia? It was really great, and I'm very happy that I got to do the issue uh, because it, it's um, it's an issue that will reach a, a wide audience. And one of the things is that I, I normally deal in smaller circles and more, um, I guess, counterculture things or stuff like that, uh, things that don't get such a wide readership. So it's really great to be able to reach a wider audience. And even if they don't uh, necessarily like all the stories that I picked or, or the issue in general, see if maybe they're interested in looking for other stuff because of this this may not speak to them uh, necessarily but maybe it will spark an interest in other conversations and people who are people of color too it might spark their interest in continuing uh, to look for for more stuff like this i agree and so daniel final word yeah i want to echo what they said just an honor a tremendous honor and just it was joyful to read so many great stories the slush power was amazing and that's not always the case. <laughs> and I really wished I had, you know, like just a huge book to fill because so many of the stories could have been in there. Um, and it, I loved that it really, there was a very expansive understanding of fantasy in uh, reflected in the slush pile. And I really tried to give that truth in the stories that I picked, um, whether it was, you know, this real world with magical elements or a whole other world or, or historical. There was so much at play, so many forms of magic and, and monsters. And that was amazing just to be a part of. And then the essays and, and the rest of the work that my co-editors picked is, is also terrific. So, you know, I just had a great time and I think it's a great um, time for us as people of color who are editors and writers and readers. Um, in the industry, because there's so much change happening, and there's so much, so there's so much community, and there's so much excitement, you know, which I think you can see very clearly in, in this conversation. So, yeah. Hmm. All right. So I think that's a great note to end on. And so we've been speaking with Daniel Jose Older, Sylvia Moreno Garcia, and Maurice Broadus. So, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And that was our panel. So big thanks again to Daniel Jose Older, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, and Maurice Broadus for joining us on the show. And remember that you can learn more about People of Color Destroy Fantasy and People of Color Destroy Horror over at DestroySF.com. I'd also like to give a special thank you to Tim Beeler and Dan Kaufman, who both just signed up this week to support us on Patreon. I'm happy to report that thanks to listeners like Tim and Dan, Geek's Guide to the Galaxy was able to raise over $16,000 in crowdfunding in 2016. Hosting this show is my full-time job, and crowdfunding represents by far the biggest revenue stream for the show, so obviously I wouldn't be able to keep doing this without the support of hundreds of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listeners who mostly chip in a dollar or two per episode. In the past two years, the podcasting space has grown vastly more competitive, 
and it's become very difficult for a podcast that's mostly devoted to written science fiction to get noticed amidst all the comedians and celebrities who now dominate the iTunes charts. I personally think that science fiction authors should be at the top of those charts, far above comedians and celebrities, but we're fighting an uphill battle there, and we can't do it without support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time or fixed monthly contribution, you can do that via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we hope you're all looking forward to another year of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, Visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.